Hi, and welcome to this installment of Frank and Mary here in Westboro. If you haven't seen this show before, my name is Art Bergeron. Uh, my day job is as an elder law attorney at Myrick O'Connell, which is actually in Westboro. But this is not about my day job. It's about my friends, Frank and Mary, um, whose goal in life is to live in their house until they die and be buried in the backyard. And if that means they're at Westboro, that means right here. So I've got this wonderful co-host, Shelby Marshall, who has continued to bring us great guests um, to help you, if you're like Frank and Mary, know the people you need to know and the programs you need to know about in order to stay right here. We've had this guest before, and as a matter of fact, this is the last of a series that he has done. Shelby, whom do we have today? Hi, good morning, Arthur. Great to see you as always. Uh, yes, yeah, so our guest today is Sherrod Mehta, um, and Sherrod is, uh, you know, Sherrod through the Rotary Club. He's doing great work as part of um, many uh, environmentally based activities there, but he's not here today as a Rotarian. He's just here today as Sherrod and uh, to present part four of the environmental series. So Sherrod, welcome. And uh, what do you have for us today? So today we are going to look at heat pumps, uh, Mary. This is part four of our environment series. So let's take a look at that. So this is part four of the environment series. Now in part one, I had begun with a simple introduction to the issues of uh, climate change and global warming and explained why there is this urgency or even a race to try and limit the uh, rise in average global temperature by less than one and a half degrees centigrade uh, by the year 2050. And for solutions, I had suggested the adoption of some of these newer technologies that are available that not only help us reduce our carbon dioxide emissions, but also offer cost saving opportunities because of the higher efficiency that they offer. Specifically, um, I had suggested the uh, choice of zero emission electricity from zero emission sources such as solar, electric vehicles for transportation, and heat pumps for heating and cooling of buildings. And today our topic is heat pumps. Now together they would be, uh, they could help us reduce our uh, carbon footprint by more than 85%, uh, all combined. And about a third of it would come from heat pumps. Before I go any further, this presentation is strictly being offered as a social service. I am not representing the interests of any enterprise, organization, or institution, and certainly no commercial interests. So let's look at heat pumps. I'm going to start by sharing with you a personal experience related to the heating of our home and the economics of it. Then we are going to look at a heat pump, look inside, uh, look at its components, how it's laid out, how it works, etc. And then we're going to look at a comparison between air source and ground source heat pumps. These are two different kinds. And finally, we have some pros and cons. Now, these are some of the acronyms that are used in this space. Uh, ASHP stands for air source heat pump. GSHP stands for ground source heat pump, and I'll explain that in just a moment. And the last one is this COP, which stands for coefficient of performance. It's one of the specifications of heat pumps. Uh, and we'll take a close look at it because it's uh, uh, quite important for us. So we have a uh, four bedroom a colonial style house in Westboro. And it's very typical of many of the homes that you see in the New England region. And we had a, a furnace, an oil furnace, which had been running for a couple of decades. And we knew that it will oil, uh, uh, burning oil produces uh, significant uh, carbon dioxide emissions. And we wanted to see what options were available for, uh, to us for reducing our uh, carbon dioxide. Uh, emissions. So we started by pulling out our oil bills and 
we found that on an year, in an year, on an average, we were consuming about more than a thousand gallons of oil through a winter, a typical winter, to heat this home. Now, when we buy a gallon of oil, what we're really purchasing is energy, right? So, we, we, uh, when we buy the oil, we, we each gallon has a certain amount of energy. And so, if you're using this much oil, and each gallon has this much energy, we multiply the two, and we get the total energy that is needed to heat this home in a typical winter. Now, this is after it has been through a massive audit and insulation improvements and things of that nature. So we need this much energy to heat our home, and this is what we are paying now, roughly $3,000 for a meter. So now we started looking at alternatives, and this is these are the choices we found. So furnace oil is what we were using now. Uh, propane would be a bit more expensive, about 25% more, but electric would be much more expensive. It would be like three times more expensive if you use this, the same amount of electricity because, uh, or the same amount of energy. Because as you know, energy is energy and we need a certain amount to heat our homes. So uh, this is the amount of energy, there's a certain amount of energy we need and this is how much it's going to cost. Now, natural gas would actually be cheaper, uh, but that's not the full picture. So now we're also interested in looking at how much carbon emissions would be produced by each of these options. So if you go to propane, well, furnace oil, first of all, produces the largest amount of CO2. So that's clearly not where we want. If you go to propane, it comes down by about 20%. If you go to natural gas, it comes down by about 30%. But if you go to electric, it comes down by more than 60%. Now this is using uh, the, the default uh, energy, the utility uh, the program, electricity supply program that's offered by our utility, which has 40% renewable, which is, uh, Green energy, from green energy sources and 60% from natural gas. Now there is a higher version that's available which can go up to 80%. You pay a little bit more, but that would bring this down even further. So electric is attractive, but this is a showstopper. This is basically unaffordable. So we didn't do anything for a while until we came across a new piece of information related to heat pumps. And that is this uh, performance spec called COP or coefficient of performance. Now, what is that? COP means that if we, let's say a pump is operating at a COP of 3.0. What 3.0 means is that if we are putting in one unit of electrical energy into the system, we will get three units of heat energy out of the pump going to heat our home. So there is this um, one, one unit of energy in two units out. Now, we know that energy cannot be created or destroyed. So what's going on here? What kind of voodoo magic is going on that allows us to spend less energy and get more energy out of it? Now, I'm still skeptical, but Let's, uh, for a moment, let's consider this, uh, this to be true. If this is true, then remember I was showing you that we, were, we would have consumed 9,000, we would have spent $9,000 using electricity. Well, this ratio, we would be spending only one third of that. So it's only $3,000. So now we are back at where, what we were spending on furnace oil. So now we're interested. Not only that, there's a bit more information here. What it's saying is that as the outside temperature changes, the COP also uh, changes, and it's actually changing for the better. So here, when the temperature outside is, let's say, 25, 30, 50 degrees, which is actually a major, major part of the winter time, 
the COP actually becomes four or five or so. So we're actually uh, going to spend even less electricity as the uh, temperature becomes uh, a little bit higher. So not only are we at the same price point, we are also, uh, it shows an opportunity for cost savings here, for savings uh, on an annual basis. So now we're interested, uh, curiosity peaked. So now we want to see how this actually works. So we want to understand how a heat pump works and whether or not it can achieve this uh, one to three ratio or one to three or one to four ratio that is being shown here. So to start with, let's look at, um, let's say there is a wall here like the green uh, block here. And it has uh, a hot air on one side and cold air on the other side. And we know from physics that hot air, the uh, energy, heat energy will flow from the hot side to the cold side. That's just the nature of it. Now, heat pumps has, have this uh, capability of reversing that flow. So they can take heat from the cold air and push it back into the hot air. So an analogy of that is with a water pump. As we know, water goes naturally from a higher level to a lower level. But a water pump can actually pump water back from the lower level to the higher level, right? Now a heat pump does something similar. Instead of pumping water, it pumps heat. So it can pump heat from a cold temperature, air at cold temperature to air at warmer temperature. And that's where it got its name. That's why it's called a heat pump. So it, it performs a similar function. It can take heat from cold and bring it to the warm side. Now, the other piece that's uh, interesting is, remember I had talked about the COP. Now, COP depends upon this temperature difference. So if the temperature difference is more, the COP is less. But as the temperature difference becomes less, the COP actually improves. So now let's look at how a heat pump, what components it has and how it's laid out. So we'll start with an analogy. Let's see, uh, uh, this is a bicycle pump, all right? And when we, Arthur, you're laughing. <laughs> I can't hear you, but sorry. You're just such a wonderful teacher. I just, it's just, it's wonderful to watch. I can just, I keep picturing you in a classroom. It's just really wonderful. <laughs> well, so, no, I'm sorry. trying to make it very basic. So I'm and very important for me. And, this is very important, right? So let's say there's a bicycle pump. And well, Let's say we pump, when we pump air into the bicycle from the air outside, it gets compressed and it goes through this pipe and it comes out of the nozzle from here. Now, when it does that, if we run our fingers outside the nozzle, we, we can feel that the air is actually cold. It's actually colder to touch. It's colder than the air outside. So what's happening is when the air is compressed and it expands suddenly at the nozzle, it actually cools. And it cools uh, to, at a point where it's colder than the air outside. And a basketball pump has the same thing. If you uh, feel the uh, air outside the nozzle, it feels colder. So now let's see how what the components of a heat pump are and how they're organized. Basically, a heat pump has four components. There's a compressor, which is very similar in function to the pump. And it's not a whole lot different than the compressor that we have in the refrigerators in our home. And then we have two radiators. One is inside the house and the other is outside the house. And these radiators are no, not a whole lot different functionally from the uh, radiators that we have in our cars, all right? And then, so one, two, three, and this fourth item is this expansion valve, which is very similar to, in function to the nozzle that we were looking at. So now let's see how it works. So we turn on the compressor, the air, there is a, a gas flowing through these lines, 
and the gas gets compressed and starts to flow, flow flows through this coil and it comes to the expansion valve. Now here, it suddenly expands like we were having at the, at the bicycle pump. And when it expands, it actually cools. Now it's conceivable by adjusting the pressure of the gas here and by making the uh, nozzle finer and so on, um, you can make this uh, air, this gas becomes become cooler and cooler, right? So it becomes colder and colder and colder until it reaches a point where it's now colder than the air outside. So now this is the warm side, this is the cooler side. So now energy flows, the heat energy flows in to this gas. So it picks up some energy here, heat energy. Now it continues to flow until it comes to the compressor and then it gets compressed. So some more energy is added, electrical energy that gets converted to heat gets added. So this gas is picked up energy from here, uh, heat energy from here, and some more energy was added from the compressor. So now this energy laden gas is coming in and it comes into the house. And this coil is now warmer than the air that's inside the house. So now heat starts to flow from this coil into the house. And this is how we are bringing the heat in to warm our house. So now what's happening? Well, we're uh, consuming the electricity here, which is the energy that we are paying for. But this coil is picking up energy from outside. And this radiator is pretty large. So it picks up a large amount of energy from the outside. And some amount of energies, uh, electrical energies uh, consumed here. And the combination of that is used to heat the home. So this is how we can get the description of performance that I was talking about, because it's not violating physics, it's actually using more of the energy from outside and bringing it into the house uh, using this principle. Okay. So, Next thing I'm going to do is look at a, uh, we're going to look at a ground source heat pump. Now, what we saw here was an air source heat pump because it was drawing heat from the air. The ground source heat pump has a similar principle. So there is a, a pipe that goes into the ground. Uh, it's a few inches in diameter uh, and it goes really deep. It goes between 500 to 800 feet deep. Shara, this is what we would consider geothermal. Is that correct? That would be an example of this, or is that and, not correct? Geothermal is different. Geothermal it is different. Okay. All right. It is different. Now, this is just called ground source heat pump. Uh, geothermal actually uses geothermal energy, which is a little different. Uh, this is basically that's your that's your next course. <laughs> All right, but this is really using you know the ground temperature, and I'll explain that in just a second. So. It, this uh, this pipe uh, actually carries a, a fluid, which is like glycol, which is basically the same fluid that's used in our uh, radiator, uh, the, the radiator fluid that we have in our cars. It's the same uh, fluid. And so the way this works is when the winter temperature is cold outside, uh, this fluid is cold and it's pumped down to the bottom of the hole and then comes up, but the ground is warmer. So this liquid gets heated up and so warm liquid comes back up. Now in the summertime, the opposite happens. This uh, liquid is hot or warm, let's say it's 90 degrees outside. So it goes down, but now the ground is relatively cooler. So now it uh, drop, really, uh, drops off some energy here and comes back cooler. So if you've been to like an underground cave uh, or actually even the basement of your house, you know that it's more or less, it has a steady temperature throughout the year. And it's, uh, you know, about 40, 40 to 50 degrees. And this pump is really taking advantage of that because in the summertime, it's cooler for us, which is what we need. And in the winter time, it's warmer, which is what we need. So it's, take, it's taking advantage of this natural deposit of uh, 
energy at a constant temperature that's available here. So the advantage of this ground source pump is, remember I had mentioned that the COP actually improves when the temperature difference is less. So because the uh, ground source heat pump is able to maintain a smaller difference in temperature because of this function, it actually has a better COP than the air source heat pump. And so here, uh, an air source heat pump would have a, a COPs of three to five or so. A ground source heat pump would be from four to six or seven or even higher. It's a lot more efficient. So short, you're probably going to get into this if it's more, much more efficient. Is it much more efficient sort of on the, you know, the upfront costs? Uh, I'm very familiar. I have um, air source heat pumps right. and they're great. Yeah. Um, never considered ground source, but is there a, a, a higher investment cost, startup yeah. costs? Yes. So that's really what the, the catch is here. The ground source heat pumps are about three times more expensive as compared to air source heat pumps. And so for residential, for example, an air source heat pump would have an ROI or return on investment compared to oil, uh, oil furnace of about uh, uh, oil fuel of about eight to 10 years. A uh, ground source heat pump for the same uh, ROI would be about 25 years or so. But it's really suitable for large buildings such as schools, offices, condo complexes, and uh, you know larger buildings. It, they really become very efficient and very competitive, and they also offer the zero emissions uh, advantage. So they're very very uh, suitable there. In residential, they may be used in cases where the you know, the developer decides to put a common air, so, uh, common ground source, so a number of pipes at the beginning of the building the subdivision, and then supplies that to a, a number of houses in a neighborhood together. And then it may become more advanced. So uh, just a few pros and cons. So it, uh, a heat pump provides heating in the winter and cooling in summer. So it's one unit providing heating and cooling. We don't need a separate air conditioner unit for the summer, which is nice. It reduces uh, our furnace oil bills, if that was the case I just described. Uh, it, reduced, it reduces our CO2 emissions, uh, which, is, which was our original goal, especially when we're using energy from renewable sources. Uh, for us, we have a solar system as well, so that helps out even more. And it has a low maintenance cost. And for disadvantages, it has a higher initial cost, uh, but that is being substantially subsidized by the government's incentive, both, fe both federal and state, uh, which really make this feasible at this point, uh, economically feasible. And then it has a weather dependence. Uh, the COP decreases, decreases with the temperature, as I have just explained. And it has a lifespan of, of about 10 to 15 years compared to 20 to 25 years for gas or oil furnace. And lastly, uh, in, New, in the New England region, uh, the heat pump does require a backup heating system because as I was showing, when the temperature becomes less than 25 degrees, let's say 10 degrees or five degrees, at that time, the heat pumps are not, uh, they consume a lot of energy and they're not efficient enough. So there just isn't enough uh, heat in the air outside to pull in. So they need a backup system. And uh, in our uh, case, they're basically integrated into the heat pump as a standard. And in our case, we have a propane uh, backup. And in general, for about 75% of the time during a year, 75 to 80%, we actually run on electricity and for the balance of the time, for the really few cold days, we actually run on uh, propane. So that's the story of heat pumps. Wow, Arthur, uh, Arthur, you're on mute. So um, that's okay. Um, that you. was that yeah, was we great. Were, we we were having construction in our neighborhood. This is the only thing about Zoom, right? Is I know, right? You're kind of living your environment, right? So. Right. Sure. This is this is great. Um, as I had mentioned, um, we have uh, we invested in heat pumps at our house 
um, just about 10, 11 years ago. Um, it's an old home, so it was a, you know, a retrofit and um, I can't imagine living without them now. We have uh, oil uh, as, a, as our other system, um, but uh, we use the heat pumps uh, constantly Right. Um, and, um, they've been, you know, a godsend, particularly on the cooling side. Um, but also on the heat side, you know, as we're transitioning before we get to, um, you know, the colder months and even in the colder months, I will tell you that they are, they are faster to heat up a room, um, even in the coldest of cold days than it is when we're incrementally increasing the thermostat for oil heat. So, um, there are a lot of great vendors out there, and uh, I would encourage folks to uh, take a look at that as part of their mass save uh, um, uh, audit to see whether or not that's something that you know is a future investment and would work for them. Yeah, I think it's I think it's terrific that you're really looking at this as a community in terms of the the information going to the entire community and really trying to get the community buy-in. You know, I think I think this every one of the themes that you've done through these four shows, right? really, really, I mean, the, the underlying theme is really this educational piece, you know, that you're really, people have no idea. And they hear a million things from a million different places. But if you're hearing it locally from like real people, like Sherrod, you're just like a real, real guy, you know? And so, you know, you look, you're a pretty trustworthy looking guy. So it would just, I think it may, it'll open a lot of people's eyes to be willing to consider it, right. to be willing to consider it. I think they're gonna be amazed by the results. You know, the general impression is that when we talk green, it just means more expensive and more money. And really the myth that I want to break through is that that's not true. It's actually offering cost-saving opportunities. Each of these technologies actually is offering cost-saving opportunities. And those who don't consider it or miss the opportunity are actually missing on these cost-saving uh, uh, opportunities of taking advantage of the uh, new technologies that are coming online. It's so pretty amazing. Which that's is pretty really amazing. What, what uh, the, the point that I'm make, uh, making and you know breaking the myth of you know green is expensive. No, mm -hmm. it's not. Yeah. It's actually cheaper. Yeah. So Sh Shelby, before we go, yep. Any any <laughs> quick comments regarding what's going on in town? Uh, I just, I want to remind folks uh, just on this, um, the heels of Sherrod's presentation, um, that if you have not signed on to the community aggregation pro um, uh, program called Westboro Power Choice, you can go to our website, the town's website, it's right on the front page, you can click on it. The town um, purchases electricity in bulk, basically, and you can sign on for different levels of green energy, if you will. Um, but definitely a cost savings opportunity that literally takes a click, 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 um, and it's a vetted program. So I want to remind folks of that. We had a successful town meeting. Um, folks can certainly watch the replay of that um, on Westboro TV if you're so inclined. And um, uh, the results of the warrant um, are usually posted uh, pretty, pretty soon after. So uh, it was successful. We got it done in far less time than I thought it was going to take, um, given the number of articles. Um, and, um, but that's about it, Arthur. So I want to wish everyone a, a wonderful upcoming Memorial Day weekend. It's we're a little ways out from it, but I want to thank um, certainly those um, who have sacrificed for us, our veterans and their families um, for, you know, the ultimate sacrifice so that we can um, enjoy the life we live. Thank you very much, Shelby. Thank you for that. Sherrod, thanks a million. Folks, I, you know, this is one of those where you really ought to watch the reruns too. If you've watched any of these shows, it should make you watch all the others because you're just, you have, a, you have the ability to really contribute something fundamental to kind of like saving the planet while saving money. And that's a pretty amazing thing. So Sherrod, thanks a million. Shelby, thanks a million, folks. We hope you, to see you on the next installment of Frank and Mary here in Westboro. Thank you very much.